Without further ado, we have Dr. Dever. He's the uh, head physiologist for MIT. Uh, works with the uh, VO2 max testing at Ohio Health uh, as part of the runner's clinic and that sort of a thing. Uh, sees a lot of you uh, on, it, on like, any given day to uh, do heart rate testing and that sort. Also has worked with uh, Olympians in the past. A tremendous amount of experience, so if you need to interact on heart rate, hydration, nutrition, this is your man. Dr. Dever. Thanks, Jeff. Hi everyone, thanks for coming. So what, like Jeff said, what I want to talk to you all about tonight is just to sort of get your mind to start to get it around the idea of heart rate guided training. Now I, I recognize that MIT is 110% built on the philosophy of pace groups. And I'm with the 830s, or I'm with the 10s, or the 11s, or the 930s, whatever pace group you're with. What we want to have everyone to start try to, to try to think about is instead of running at a pace every week, we want you to start to try to think about not maybe start doing it this time around, maybe the next time around, but start at least thinking about the idea of heart rate guided training. And the reason why we want to have people start to think about that is, is because it really is the most effective way to train to become a faster runner, to lower your race times. If that's what your goal is with MIT, is to become faster, to get better time, to qualify for Boston, or just to drop your half marathon time, drop your marathon time. Really the way to do it, everyone, is with heart rate guided training. I don't know any professional endurance athlete, whether they be a runner, cyclist, or triathlete, and I know a tremendous number of them. I've tested them. And I'm not telling you this to boast. I'm telling you this because it, this is the way they train. Professional athletes train this way, endurance athletes do. And probably the most successful people in MIT have embraced this as well and trained this way. Not the least of which is our own Dr. Wright. I know you, many of you heard last week, Dr. Wright trains this way, and I'll tell you this story right off the top. And then we'll get to what I'm going to talk about. So Dr. Wright was, had been trying to qualify for the Boston Marathon for years, about seven years. Every year he failed. Failed once, failed twice, failed three, failed four, failed five, failed six, failed seven. He finally had this test done that I'm going to talk about, started to do heart rate guided training, qualify for Boston next year. And there's plenty of other, forget what the pros do, I know I'm not a pro, I don't what that's good for them. This is what the most successful people at MIT do as well. And not just all the people that qualify for Boston, people that just want to be under four hours, or under four and a half hours in a marathon. This is really the best way to train you guys. So, let me start out with talking about something that many people are confused about, and that's your true maximum heart rate. Your maximum heart rate is determined by two things and two things alone. One, did you pick your parents right? And two, how old are you? Maximum heart rate is determined by two things, your genetics and your age. You can't train maximum heart rate. Fitness has no influence on your max heart rate. And what I mean by that, you guys, is the best way to think about it is, imagine every, each one of you has a clone. That clone of you is 50 pounds heavier, smokes, drinks, and has a wretched diet. Both you and, and you are the most aerobically fit version of yourself that you can possibly be. So there's you and the clone. You both have the exact same max heart rate. The exact same. Fitness has no influence on your max heart rate. The fitter you get, your max heart rate doesn't go up. The less fit you are, it doesn't go down. Did I pick my parents well? And how many candles are on my cake? That's what determines your max heart rate. Nothing else. Not your fitness. It really has nothing to do with it. You can predict max heart rate with this prediction equation I reckon many of you have heard of, 220 minus 8. There's another one I'm going to talk about as well that's a little more accurate, but it's still not that great. But this is one way that most people predict their max heart rate is 220 minus 8. So, there's a couple of ways we're going to estimate max heart rate. The first one is what we call the straight estimate, which is just 220 minus 8. The second formula is something called the Carbonin formula. It's capitalized because that's actually someone's name, Dr. Carbonin. So the straight estimate is 220 minus 8. It's just a very simple thing. You take your desired percentage of that number. So I want to train at 70% of my max heart rate today. So I'm going to assume that you're all just the shiny 20-year-olds. So your max heart rate is, thank you, you're welcome. So your max heart rate is 200, 220 minus 20. So you're going to train at 70%. So you're going to be about 140 beats today, 70% of 200. It's a very easy thing to do. 
<clears throat> the carbonin formula is a little more complicated, not a lot, it's still like sixth grade math, but it's a little more complicated than 220 minus 8. You take your resting heart rate, I'll talk about that in a little while. <clears throat> the percentage that you choose, 70%, let's say, then you use your max, and you're gonna get your max from this 220 minus 8, minus your resting. So you guys, the straight estimate is a very conservative thing. And quite honestly, if I was talking to the no boundaries group, people that have never really run before, the kind of couch to 5K programs, folks like that, or people that have just never had any physical activity at all, or pregnant women who weren't exercising before, pregnant women who weren't exercising previously, that's when I use this. Other than that, I never use 220 minus 8. It's just way too conservative. Let me show you what I mean. This, the carbonic formula is much more aggressive, and I'll show you exactly what I mean by that. This again is for less fit for beginners, older adults, pregnant women who have not exercised before. This is for fitter, more experienced people. You might be thinking, this is my first time through MIT. I'm, I'm just training for a half marathon. Am, am I in this category? Uh, yeah, you're training for a half marathon. That's 13 miles. You're, you're not someone who's just started running. Probably not at least, okay? You've been doing some activity before to get you at least to this point. So everyone, here's exactly what I mean. Here's the 70% of 200, it's 140 beats a minute. So when we take 70% with the carbonic formula, 60 beats per minute, that's what we're going to estimate as a resting heart rate for you, <clears throat> plus the 70%, 200, 220 minus 20, 220 minus age, minus the 60, minus the resting, 158 beats a minute. So they're both 70%. One of them is 140 beats a minute, the other is 158. Huge difference, you guys. 18 beats a minute is a tremendous difference in the heart rate that you're training at. That's one and a half zones. I'll talk about that in a little bit. It's usually almost two zones. That's a big difference in heart rate. For everyone that's in this room, if you're not going to have the test done that I'm going to talk about in a little bit, use this equation. Use this equation. No, you don't need to write it down now. Jeff's going to have the slides. He can send them to you all. They'll be posted on the MIT site. Don't worry about remembering it right now. But if you don't know what your max heart rate is, and you're not going to have this test that I'm going to talk about in a minute, use this equation to guesstimate your max heart rate. Okay? So the gold standard way to determine this is to do something called a VO2 max test. This is what I do a lot for the group, and we do these at, at, at Max Sports Medicine, where Dr. Bright is every day, at Nolan Tangent River Road. Some of you have tested. I've tested a lot of MIT folks. We've recently tested almost all the coaches that, that you have on Saturdays. I've recently tested almost all those. This test is performed on a treadmill if you're a runner. If you're a very serious cyclist, we can also do it on a bike. Unless you're a very, very serious cyclist, though, it's always better to do it on a treadmill. We take you to your max effort in this test. It's not long. It's only 10 to 12 minutes. The whole test is only 10 to 12 minutes long. The last, ask your coaches. The last couple of minutes, get a little ouchy. I'm not going to lie to you. But, but quite honestly, it's, it's done in 10 to 12 minutes. It's not. There's a couple of coaches here tonight. Raise your hand if it was like this horrid experience. Right, none of the coaches thought it was a horrid experience. I mean, does it, oh, does, it, does it get a little uncomfortable in the last minute or so? Absolutely it does. But it's over in 10 to 12 minutes. It's not that bad, you guys. But you do have to give me your max effort. What this permits is, it permits me to then give you precise, individualized, prescription of your heart rate training zones. I determine what your own individual true max heart rate is. Not an age predicted max, not the carbonin formula, not I'm the same height and weight as my friend, I'll use hers. Your own individual physiology. I can give you what your max heart rate is and then prescribe very specific zones for you to train in. That's the power of this data. Again, we do these at Max Sports Medicine. And, and I sit with you if you have this done. I spend about 45 to 50 minutes with you. I go over the whole thing. I explain to you exactly what it means, how to use it. It's, it's valuable data to have. It really is. So heart rate training zones. So there's five of these, you guys. The, the three that I want us to focus on tonight as beginners, people that are just starting to embrace this, are zone one, zone two, and zone three. Zone four and zone five I'll talk briefly about, but those are interval zones. I think, how many of you, this, is this your first time through MIT? Excellent. How many of you, is it your second time, first or second? Now raise your hand. 
Okay, so the rest of you are more veterans with MIT. I think if it's your first time through MIT, or even if it's your second time, I would say you probably don't want to do too many, if any, intervals. If you're a first time half marathoner or a first time marathoner, my personal belief is you should have two goals. The first is to make it. <laughs> and I'm being completely serious. The first is to make it, and the second, and perhaps more important, is to not hate it. I want you to cross the finish line, go through the shoe, get your bagel, get your medal, woohoo! I want, within 30 minutes, I want you to think, yeah, I'll do that again. That's what we want. I want you to not hate it, and I want you to make it. That's what your two singular goals should be the first time around. You establish a time, now you've got a time to beat. Your first time, don't shoot for a time the first time. The first time, shoot to make it to the finish line. That should be your goal. I'm dead serious. That should be your goal. So we're not going to do an interval. We're going to do zone one, which we call active recovery. This is a very easy aerobic activity. Zone two, this is where you should be on Saturday. Zone two are, is, is what we call the LSD zone, long, slow distance. This is what we call run that, that zone in the 70s and 80s, the LSD zone, long, slow distance. That's where you should be on Saturdays. And for many of your other runs during the week as well. I know Saturday is the long run, but you know, you guys, we're gonna to come to a point in the training plan where the long run, if you're doing a full, let's say, the long run is gonna be 17, 18, 19 miles on Saturday. And then there's gonna be other days during the week where you're only gonna go 10 miles or 12. Those runs should also be in zone two. Zone two is a heart rate zone. It's not a mileage zone. Zone two is not only to be used on Saturday. It's not a Saturday zone. It's a zone that's, that's a heart rate training zone that you will use quite honestly for most of your runs. Zone three is what we call a tempo run, which you'll start to hear people in your group talk about. Your coaches will talk about this. Jeff will talk about this as the head coach. So the tempo run is what I like to call comfortably hard. So it's definitely faster than your zone two run on Saturday, but it's not an interval zone yet. What I mean by comfortably hard is this. You're going to go out and do a 40 minute tempo run. Your partner, your spouse, a friend is gonna ride their bike along beside you to keep you company. No matter how fast you're running, it's not gonna be hard work for them on a bike. They're just riding next to you to keep you company, pass the time, they're going to be chatting away, talk, 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 talk. If you can sort of communicate back to them in two and three word sentences, yeah, I saw that. We can go there for dinner. That was a good movie. I read that article. Like, if you can communicate back like that, you're right where I want you. If you can't talk at all, you feel like they're yanking you by your tongue, you're going away too fast. If you can carry on a full conversation, you're confusing tempo with Saturday. Saturday should be full conversational pace, which brings me back to that. You guys, if you can't talk the whole time on Saturday, guess what you're doing? You're in the wrong pace group. You need to slow down. If you can't carry on, and I'm not shouting like I am, not my lecture voice, but if you can't carry on a full conversation on Saturday, you're going too fast. Ego, there it goes, it's drifting away. <laughs> slow down, slow down. I promise you, you'll run faster. The Kenyans do. Slow down, Brian Hall does. Slow down, you're gonna get faster. I know it's counterintuitive. Deborah wants me to slow down to run faster. Yep, ask Dr. Bray, it works. So zone three, comfortably hard. It, it, honestly, you guys, if you've been running for a little while, zone three runs are the ones that kind of tend to feel really good. You're, you're kind of pushing a little bit, it's just you're out there, you're in your zone, no pun intended, you're cruising along, it feels good, there's some ceiling left, if you really had to drop it, if a bear jumped out of the woods at you, you could take off if you needed to, it's definitely not a really slow Saturday run though, okay? so. Zone four is interval one zone. Zone five is interval two, the highest interval zone. These are, zone five is going to be, the top of zone five would be your true max heart rate, down about 10 to 12 beats from that. So that's working very, very hard. 
These are the Wednesday night track workouts with Jeff. These are hill repeats. That's what the intervals are. Doing the intervals is very, very hard work. Again, if it's your first time through, or maybe even your second, I wouldn't necessarily even worry about this. Get a few seasons of MIT under your belt, get a, a half marathon, a full under your belt, then we'll talk about introducing intervals. Then, and, and once you learn how to do them, you'll learn to love them, and they really do make you faster, but I wouldn't start out doing those right away if it's your first time through. Quite honestly, you guys, almost all of your miles on your legs are gonna be in zone two, which is completely fine. Make it, don't hate it. Remember your mantra. I'm gonna make it and I'm not gonna hate this, I'm gonna come back again, because that's what's best for me and my health, to keep coming back. Zone three runs, do a tempo run now and again. It's totally fine, it lets you kind of loosen up a little bit, let your legs move. No more than one, maybe two a week if you're a little more experienced. If you're just getting started, one tempo run a week. What do I mean by let me jump back up to zone one? What is active recovery? Just what it says. You're doing something active, but you're allowing your body to recover. If you belong to a gym, if you have a stationary bike, if you have a bike you actually have to balance on, a real bike, if your zone one workout, again, is active recovery, don't run. Because you guys, even a real slow run is still a run. Which means you're still doing this. You're still kind of beating yourself up, not only physically with the impact of running, but also just like, oh, I'm running again. It's the, just do something different. Jump on a stationary bike, cool run, use a kickboard in the pool, use an elliptical, just do something. Go out to Easton and walk around. This time of year, move some mulch around in your yard. Break, you know, that's what I mean, active recovery. It's a very, very low heart rate zone. You're doing something active, but you're allowing your body to recover. Knees, I'm not even going to spend any time talking about tonight again. They're interval zones. We'll talk about how to do intervals at a later date. If you come back to the more experienced talk for heart rate diet and training, that's what I'll talk more about the intervals. So the heart rate training zones, we know that most amateur endurance athletes spend almost all their time training in the upper part of zone three, even flirting into zone four. You guys, I've been doing this a long time, and I can't, if I had a dollar for every amateur endurance athlete I've ever tested, that they spend almost all their time running in upper zone three, even flirting into four, and the only thing they ever change is the mileage. You, talk, you ask them, well, what did you do today? Oh, I ran eight miles. How fast did you go? Oh, the speed I always go. What did you do tomorrow? Well, I, I ran 12. How fast? Well, the speed I always go. What are you doing? You're not, you're not using from the shoulders north. Engage this thing up here. Train smarter, not harder. That's what this is all about. Train smarter, not harder. I call this training never, never late because it's not hard enough to get you really fit, but it's nowhere near easy enough to allow your body to recover and get rid of that fatigue. And as you get older and older, you keep doing this all the time. It's always running at the same pace, always running at the same pace. All you're doing is giving yourself the fast track in to see Dr. Bright. And I don't mean to have coffee. I mean because you have an overuse injury. Plantar fasciitis, Achilles tendonitis, IT things, piriformis. You guys know what I'm talking about. You've all wrestled with some of these things maybe. Most times it's because people are training too hard all the time. Slow down. That's the message. Consequences include less effective interval training, which again, we'll get to that. The other consequences include you're much more likely to have an increased risk of an overuse injury. Again, it's Achilles tendonitis, plantar fasciitis, all IT band problems, all kinds of things like that that runners tend to suffer from. So professional endurance athletes training such as their heart rate diet, just consider starting to commit to that. Just get your head around it. Maybe not every run, Figure out what your heart rate is with the carbonate if you don't want to come in and have a max test done. And then just, you need a heart rate monitor, so you have to buy a heart rate monitor. And, and just, where am I when I go out for a run? Where, where is my heart, what is my heart doing when I'm out for a run? You need a heart rate monitor to do this. So you have a chest strap on, you have a watch on, you monitor your heart rate. It's, it's really the best way to train, you guys. We need to learn your true resting heart rate. If there's one bit of homework, that I really, this doesn't cost you any money. I really would like everyone in MIT to do this. Figure out what your true resting heart rate is. 
This is how this is how to do it, and then I'm going to tell you why I want you to do it. The how is this: over the course of the next two weeks, pick out five or six days. They should not be successive days, but they should be what I call school nights, where you got to go to school the next day, where you got to go to work. So Sunday night through Thursday night, when you got to go to work the next day or school the next day. When you first awaken in the morning, before you've gotten out of bed, so not after you've gotten up and voided your bladder, not after you've gotten up and, and brushed your hair, or put your girl on or whatever, just when you're still lying in bed, okay? When you're still lying in bed, I want you to do elbow flexion. I want you to do the carotid pulse right here. I want you to count for 30 seconds, how many beats, multiply by two. Jot that number down. Do that like five or six times over the course of two weeks, average it. You guys, that will give you pretty good insight into what your true resting heart rate is. The reason I don't want you to do this on weekend nights is because most people tend to stay up later, have more alcohol, have more caffeine, have more food. All of those things, staying up later, alcohol, caffeine, food, all those things influence your resting heart rate in the morning. So after as normal a day as possible for you, however, whatever normal is for you, it's different for everyone, do this in the morning. The reason why you want to do this is there's really very few better gauges of how fatigued you are than what your resting heart rate is doing. If you know, if you figure out your resting heart rate, let's say it's 50, and then what I want you to start to do is take it fairly regularly. Start to tune into your body. What is my body doing every day? So now you know it's 50, you wake up one morning and you take it, and it's 56. Now all you've done is this. You haven't even gotten, you haven't turned over, you haven't gotten out of bed, you haven't run, you're still horizontal. And your heart rate is six beats higher than it should be. You're fatigued. You're fatigued. And if you're supposed to do a long, hard run that day, don't do it. Because you're not going to get as much out of it as you could. Again, you guys, I don't know any professional endurance athlete that doesn't obsess about their resting heart rate. It guides their morning workouts, and they take it when they wake up from their daily nap, and it guides their afternoon training sessions. They really tune into that. So just humor me. Figure out your resting heart rate. It's free. It'll take you five or six days over the course of a couple of weeks. Just figure out what it is for. <clears throat> so... You guys, this is all about training smarter, not harder. That's what we want you to do. We want you to get the most out of your running. We want you to get the best stimulus from every run so you'll get the best adaptation. The fitness that you're gaining is an adaptation. Your body is adapting. What is it adapting to? It's adapting to a stimulus. What's the stimulus? All the training that you're doing. Any biological system, including a full organism like a human being, will adapt to a stimulus if it's given often enough. The stimulus here is the training. The adaptation is the fitness. We want to have the best stimulus to get the best adaptation. And if you're always running at the same pace and you're always running too fast, you're never giving your body the best stimulus, so you're never going to get the best adaptation, which means to everyone here, my race times are never going to get any better. I'm never going to get any faster. And it's going to start to become drudgery because I'm going to be running at the exact same pace every single day. The only thing I'm going to change is the mile. It's not what we want. We want it to be enjoyable. We want you to be some days up, some days down. Some days we're going to work really, really, really hard. Then we're, next day we're going to take it way down. That's what this is all about. So your fitness doesn't increase while you train. That's training stress creates adaptations. And those adaptations occur during rest. You've got to have hard training balanced with adequate recovery time. Rest is more than a necessary evil. You need to let your body rest. Part of that rest is short zone two workouts and the zone one workouts. You've got to have those interspersed in your weekly training plan. Rest is more than a necessary evil. So that's all I have right now. So I understand you're all going to do a short run and get all your stuff next doors. Um, I'm going to be around. If you want to ask me questions, I'm happy to try and answer them. So, I'll see you in a little bit. Thank you.